Uh, well, hello, it's James Holland here. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. I still haven't got Al, but I have got Dr. Peter Johnston with me. We're here at the National Army Museum, and we're looking at one particular cabinet here. Now, this is, I'm looking at a battle dress, the turtle helmet, a couple of flags, some medals, including a military cross, and a map of the Sword Beach area. So, Peter, let, talk me through it. I've always been a big advocate of the, of the battle dress. I kind of, you know, it's much maligned, but it seemed to work for me. Um, and what I notice about this is an officer's version, so it's not buttoned up all the way. It's got the little lapels. And this this is the Ike jacket, isn't it? Or the Ike jacket comes a little bit from this. I think so. I think so, definitely. I mean, this is sort of that iconic dress that the, the, the British officers of the Second World War were certainly uh, dressed in. And if you, if you think back to where we were earlier about the displays, you know, our first World War figure next to our second World, figure, yeah. World War figure, you can see there's not actually a radical difference in what the, the British Army wear. I still think here at the museum, we, we still actually astound our visitors because our visitors are so used to seeing soldiers in, in, in camouflage mm. and the various trends that go with it. And then they come in and, and think like, wow, well, why is there no... Why is there no camouflage on this? Why is this, this you know, why are these guys who fought the Second World War, why are they wearing this heavy sort of wool material and, and, and it doesn't seem very functional? What happens if it gets wet? And, you know, the answer is you end up, you know, being bloody miserable. Yeah, because uh, it's itchy and soggy. Because it's itchy and soggy. But, you know, um, f for us, this is, a, this is a wonderful uniform, not because it shows what the British Army fought and, and, and won the war. But because in. who wore it? Because of who wore it, exactly that. And, you know, Alfred Rowe was a beach master. Uh, Captain Alfred Rowe. Yeah, Captain, Captain Rowe. He was a beach master. And these are guys who were probably a bit, well, you know, your, your, your book on Normandy uh, talks about, you know, the drive to get off the beach and all these sort of things and how important that was. And these guys were absolutely essential in that. Yeah. They, they, got the, they got the traffic moving. They got mm -hmm. people, they got the people up there, they got them ready, they got the supplies ashore, got them where they needed to go. And that a was hell a hell of a job, that, isn't it? it? I mean, just thinking of the logistics of that, yeah, the it, detail it, you need to know and, the, and just how organised your mind needs to be yeah, it, it, but, with all the other crap that's going on around you i mean it's just unbelievable let alone while someone's dropping shells on you yeah right exactly uh, and and you know but the, also the ability to, to to react and think on your feet and when invariably the, a landing craft turns up in the wrong place uh, and people are miles off because the heavy swell has battered them about you've just got to make snap decisions haven't you and exactly. stick with them and you've got to be you've got to have a pretty grip a good grip of what's going on behind you you know you yeah. can't just either be looking out to sea and watching guys come in you can't just be looking up the beach so do you think someone like captain Rowe? i mean do you think kind of you know the days leading up to up to d-day itself do you think he's just just examining and, and just looking and memorizing units and you know because because it's not just sword beach is it it's green white and red um uh queen and then roger green white and red and you know you've got the the, the yorkshire's landing on the red bit the lancashire's landing on the white bit you know that's someone's gag isn't it um as in kind of you know the red and white rose etc uh, um you know there's a lot to think about you've got all these different units you've got to remember what the what the landing craft forces are that are coming through and the different landing craft numbers and who's in what i mean Blimey. I mean, it's, it's making my head hurt just thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, and that's exactly why, you know, you've got the, the, the signal flags, which are really important as well, which is all about getting people onto the beach and getting them moving, the, the red and green. But Okay, so you, you, you flap that around and that says, okay, we're now... So, so he's on the beach, landing craft coming in, you're waving that? It's semaphore. It's basically like a semaphore. Semaphore, yeah. and you're waving that. So that means we're on Green Beach, which is the largest bit of Queen... Uh, um, and, and green or ro of Roger. Yeah, exactly. But it's also like a symbol of, of, of sort of, of, of stop and go. But ahead of all that, before all but that... But it's not stop and go, is it? This is the first of the stretch of the beach. Well, right? you've got the white beach as well. Yeah, exactly. It's different. But it's, it's sort of, it's your signal. So that is stop and go, not, not green and red? Uh, it, 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 the double uppers could do both, really. You know, it's, oh, it's sort okay. of, you know, if you've got a landing craft there and the swell and you can't necessarily see it, you know, you've got to hold people offshore before they can come in, as got well you. as demarking the actual area. So the guys driving those landing craft could at least try and know what to aim for. But right. let's think about all the work that goes in before that. You know, you talked about, about Captain Rowe there and, you know, what's he doing in, in the months and, 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 you know, he's planning his final the units mm. but you know you've got the, and that's why I think this military cross is so important which is given to John Groom because he gets that for doing all the reconnaissance of the beaches too yes because you've got to know where you're going to go, where the pockets of resistance so are likely that to be. Before, beforehand, absolutely. You know, at taking beach samples, beach samples. Those that one, the wonderful story about getting people to write in with their family postcards yes, so they it's, could it's, do that's it. Amazing, isn't um, it? And, and is this kind of being dropped in a submarine and coming in in your fulbert? A little bit of that as well. Um, you know, the fulberts. Okay, so fulberts for those who don't know, they're basically sort of canvas canoes, and, and I think it comes from folding boat, doesn't yeah, it? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, uh, a fulbert, and and you sort of clamber out to, onto the conning tower get onto the, the U-boat and just uh, row yourself in in the dead of night. I mean, just imagine doing that. I mean, God, your heart must be hammering and your nerves must be taut. You've got to get onto a beach. You have no idea whether you're going to hit a mine. You have no idea whether you're going to get tangled up in wire. You have no idea whether someone's going to see you. 
it, and it's all, and take samples of sand and you've got to take I mean, samples of sand you've got to try and figure out what the tides are going to be like you've got to try and figure out if, if you're there at high tide what's under the water that you haven't found yep. um, you've, you've, you've got to try and process all of the information that's coming in from the French resistance and from the SOE who yep. are there as well yep. um, we, you know, we've, we've seen those, those wonderful low photographs that the, the mosquitoes and, uh, uh, and some of the spitfires have taken with camera guns I and mean, you've got to be pretty brave to be shooting down the beach doing that mm. um, so much so you know, there's, that, there's that film I think um, it might be in a museum across the river that we won't mention. So you see the Germans who are building it scatter across the sand as the aircraft right. comes in and, yeah, and, and yeah, snaps yeah. the pictures. Um, and you can actually see that, and that's why this map is so important. Look, if you look down the symbols, you know, fixed coast gun, medium battery, heavy battery, medium fixed coast. You medium fixed coast, how it's uh, there. Light mobile gun or gun how it's uh, Anti-tank gun, less than 50 mil. Oh, jeepers, it's, it's unbelievable. It's so much information here. And this is what I absolutely love about this, because what you're, you know, because most people, when you think about D-Day and you think landing on those bases, you just think guys in landing craft, the hatch comes down, you're slight, even if it's you're thinking about the British or the Canadians, you're just still slightly thinking of the first 20 minutes of saving Private Ryan. Absolutely. Uh, and, and actually, there's so much more that goes into it, isn't it? It's I mean, it's just incredible. The how much thought has been given over to this. And of course, they've had quite a lot of experience. They've torch landings in North Africa. You've got Sicily, Salerno, Anzio. I mean, you know, and lots and lots of others as well. Dieppe, where, it's all, Dieppe where it's all gone wrong. Yes, yes, Dieppe, of course. Yeah, exactly that. So there's lots to kind of sort of build on for this. But this lovely little display really does drive it home just how much you have to think about how much detail is thought through before you can even start to think about something like Operation Overlord. Absolutely. And for us, it was about showing that, yes, the, this is a really important part of the battle, but actually this is about some of those unsung heroes that were, were fighting and taking part in it too. You know, the, the guys who don't necessarily get the, who aren't in Saving Private Ryan, for example, yep. who, who aren't the infantry guys charging up the beach, winning, yep. winning the medals. But these are the guys that enable that to be a success. Yep. And this was pretty much a one-shot thing. You know, if they've been thrown back into the sea... Forget it. Yeah. Not for, well, certainly not for a long time, not so, a year or so. So the, the, I think the reliance on the work of, of, of guys like Alfred Rowe, of, of Kenneth Baxter, uh, of John Groom, it, it's so important that we at the museum are able to celebrate these people as much as we celebrate everyone else. Uh, and that's a really important part that we do here. You know, we, we tell soldiers stories and we tell those, that variety of roles that they fulfilled, all of which attempting to achieve the victory. Yeah, brilliant. Well, Peter, I can't thank you enough for being with us all afternoon and for all the stuff you've shown us and for showing us around um, and to you and all the team and to Justin Majeski, who's overall IC of, uh, of the Army Museum. It's a brilliant, brilliant museum. I'm a massive fan, so thank you very much. No problem. You're welcome anytime. time.